say on Friday, April 7th. Yay, birthday people. Good job. All right. And uh, I'm Sue Roll, your assisting minister, and today's reader is Karen Caswell. Good morning, Bethany. It is Palm Sunday, and today we have heard. Is that just checking? We have walked triumphantly into Jerusalem with Jesus on the back of a donkey, palms waving, cloaks thrown down. And in just a few moments, we're going to hear how quickly the tables turn. This is the start of Holy Week in the life of the church. This week, starting in just a few minutes, we will go from that triumphant entry into Jerusalem and we will follow Jesus' last moments, his last meal with his friends, his trial, the betrayal he went through, and ultimately his execution on a cross. This is the start of a spiritual journey that will take us through the life of Jesus and end with his death on a cross, only to find on Sunday morning that the tomb is not empty. And so as we gather today from all the weeks we've had, from spring break to really heavy feats of snow, I invite you to rise as we join in a confession of our sins. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings, too often we neglect do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt though you call us to heal. We choose fear over death. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, that we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. The love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take on our nature 
and to suffer death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. We will read from Psalm 31 responsively. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. I am the scorn of all my enemies, a disgrace to my neighbors, a dismay to my acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me, they plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, You are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. The second reading is from Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. At this time, I'd invite any kids worshiping with us this morning to come on forward. Hello, welcome everyone. It's so good to see you all. Welcome, welcome. Let's make a nice circle so we can all see each other. Oh, thank you. Um, did you guys get palm branches when you came into church today? Do you know what that's all about? Yeah. Yes. And so this week, 
right at the beginning of the service, we heard a story about Jesus walking into Jerusalem, which was this big, holy, holy city. And Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, and these people were around, and they were laying branches. They were also laying their coats on the ground. Why would people be doing that? I know it's very confusing, right? Have you ever laid your coat on the ground? No, I've never laid my coat on the ground. Have you ever laid a branch on the ground for someone? Right, that sounds kind of like a tripping hazard, right? Maybe not the safest thing to do. But these people were gathering around because they had heard news that Jesus, and they had heard all these like crazy stories about Jesus. And they had gathered because they heard Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and the roads were kind of dusty. So what they did for special people when they came into the city was they laid down their coats. They laid down branches so these people, these important special people, wouldn't get dusty. That's kind of cool, right? They like knew what Jesus was all about. And so we wave palms today to remember that Jesus went into that holy city super awesome. He was a super cool guy, very popular, getting pretty famous. It was a good day to be Jesus and a good day to be followers of Jesus. Do you know what they were shouting when they waved the branches? Hosanna, does that sound familiar? Yeah, does anyone know what Hosanna means? That's fair. I had to go to school to be a pastor to find out what Hosanna means. It's a hard word, but it means God help us. So they were shouting this out as Jesus was walking in on a donkey, coats and branches on the ground. People were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Why would they be doing that? What would they need help with? Yeah. Yeah, help with doing anything. What are some things that we ask God to help with? Sicknesses, that's a great one. What else do we ask God to help with? Yeah. Help us to not be sad anymore. That's a good prayer, too. That's really good. What about to help us love one another? Right? Uh, What about for there to be no fighting anymore? Right, that's a good one. What about prayers for hungry people? Right, and for people who don't have everything that they need. Right, and so they were praying the same kind of prayers, and that's why they were shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And don't, we still ask God to help us, right? Just like they did, because we know Jesus is a pretty cool guy, right? And so this week, we're going to hear a lot of stories when we come to church about Jesus' life, and we're also going to hear about how Jesus died, right? Do you guys know that story, how Jesus died on a cross? Yeah, and that one is kind of a sad story, but we need to remember that our friend Jesus did not stay dead, not for very long. It was just three days, because guess what we're going to celebrate next Sunday in church? Yeah. Easter, and what do we celebrate on Easter? Easter. Yes. God rising from the cross. Yes. Death could not keep Jesus down. And so when we hear all of these stories, they might make us sad. They're sometimes kind of hard stories to hear. But we remember that our friend Jesus does not stay dead. And we remember that we can ask him for help. And that's a cool thing. Ooh, I'm feeling kind of stiff. And I've got to pray. Would you guys mind stretching with me? I'm just feeling kind of... Like, I couldn't pray right now. All right. What about, oh, that's a mic pack. We'll get that later. All right, stretch them. Oh, that feels nice. I'm still feeling like maybe I need to touch my toes before we pray. How does that sound? All right, touch them down and reach to the left and reach to the right. All right, I'm feeling warmed up. Fold your hands in and repeat after me. I invite everyone to repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for hearing our prayers. When we cry Hosanna, through your son Jesus we pray, amen.
Thank you guys so much. Today we're gonna do the noisy offering during our regular offering time, so I'll help you guys with that. And also, there are coloring pages in the back. My friend Rodney would love to help you with get a coloring page and some markers. All right, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I invite everyone else to rise as we welcome our gospel. All right, thanks all. <laughs> going to help us read it today. So this is the Gospel of Matthew, beginning with chapter 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him, one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He, he answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written, as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? 
Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a signal, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how, then, would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, at least two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you were also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. 
When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he could not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits, bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. 
He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over in the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were all... The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. One the evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go. Make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. This is the gospel of our Lord. Today marks the beginning of Holy Week. This week we gather to hear stories of Jesus' final moments in life and we hear about his death. This morning we heard the story as told by the book of Matthew. Thursday and Friday this week, we're going to delve into the story as told by the book of John. And it's all the same story. It's the story of Jesus walking toward the cross to die. And we have been walking alongside him this season of Lent. We have heard the stories of his life and his ministry, all while knowing, just like Jesus did, that we will end up here, at the foot of the cross, looking up to where Jesus died. But even then, we know that the women gathered at the foot of the cross. We know what they did not. Look at this cross in our sanctuary. It's empty. We know that Jesus does not stay there. Jesus does not stay dead. We have the benefit of knowing this. So why is it still so important that year after year, We hear these stories. Why do we bother year after year? It's quite an investment of time, don't you think? Let's take a look at these Holy Week stories together. The week begins with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We have our palms, and that's always a good time in church. 
We processed into the church because it's a celebration of who Jesus is. The crowd shouted, Hosanna. They cried out, God, help us. They recognized Jesus as the Son of God. They saw Jesus. They had heard the stories about Jesus, and they knew that he was the Messiah, the Emmanuel, God with us. Big success. All was good and right and well for Jesus and his friends as they made their way into Jerusalem. And now we just heard the passion story. The story that takes us from Jesus' last meal, the Passover meal, with his friends, all the way to the cross. Jesus ate that meal with his 12 disciples, his closest followers, and his closest friends. And then we hear the story of how each one abandons him. It begins with Judas, but none of the 12 are found at the foot of the cross. They couldn't face it. Jesus came into the city triumphant in glory. They laid down coats in the street for him, but now they face his betrayal, his trial, his humiliation, his defamation, and his very public, very brutal execution. And they could not bear it. And who can blame them? It's a hard thing to bear. It's an impossible thing to bear. Imagine the brutality of the Roman Empire, the power of the religious authority, the betrayal of friends and of home, all bearing down on one person. On Palm Sunday, or Passion Sunday, we call them both. We are faced with the paradox of Jesus' grand entrance into the holy city of Jerusalem and the Jesus who dies the brutal death of thousands at the hands of the Roman Empire. Jesus, instead of rising up as a king or a ruler or a savior, just dies. He's killed. He becomes one of the many persons crucified under the reign of the Roman Empire. Why do we hear this story year after year? Why do the details of Jesus' last moment and Jesus' death matter to us? Why does it matter that we hear this story? Lent is a liturgical season of the church that lasts 40 days. It's a bit longer than some, but it's still shorter than others. The week Lent began for us this year, the year 2023, was the week we received news of the shooting on Michigan State University's campus. Since Ash Wednesday, the start of Lent, there have been at least 60 mass shootings in the US. Seven of those happened in K through 12 schools. Last week, 39 migrants were killed during a fire in a detention facility in Ciudad Juarez. Two families were found dead in the St. Lawrence River. Canadian authorities believe they were crossing from Canada to the United States, that they were refugees fleeing Eastern Europe, including one child and one infant. Agreeing on policies and on procedure and on opinion and what we should do with government dollars is a very hard thing. It's a very hard thing for us to do in the United States right now. We disagree a lot, and we distance ourselves from people who don't agree with us. We all know the polarizing issues that divide us. But this week, this holy week, Christians around the world will gather together. In this country, we gather in this congregation we gather, despite of, and maybe even sometimes because of these differences, but we gather to hear this story. The story of a crucified man, a man executed by the government, a man betrayed by his friends, a man who, according to the religious authority of the day, did everything wrong. He deserved it. He brought it on himself. And we are asked, as disciples of Jesus, to look at the death 
in our world and to see the crucified peoples and to actually see them. It is a hard thing to look at suffering. It might even be harder than agreeing on policy. It's hard to look at poverty and addiction and desperation and loneliness and grief and execution and violence and hunger and disease. It is hard to look at the face of suffering. We want to look away, but Jesus asks us to see the person. Jesus asks us to see the other as a beloved child of God from whom he died on that cross. The crowds in Jerusalem that day expected Jesus to be a military hero. He was going to be on their side. He was going to destroy the Roman Empire and their armies, and he was going to rule with power and might. The disciples expected Jesus to rise in glory and to stand against the oppression of the Roman Empire. He was going to do great things for the Jewish people. Jesus was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. They knew. And it is because Jesus is God's Son, it is because he is the Messiah that we hear this story year after year. This is not another king. This is not an emperor or a president or a drug lord or a prime minister or anything that holds power that this world might know. This is the Son of God come to die a humiliating death along with all the other forgotten and oppressed and crucified peoples of this world. That is the face of the Messiah. That is the face of Jesus the Christ. Hosanna, God help us. Jesus stands with the forgotten masses of the world's crucified peoples. Hosanna, because Jesus came not for glory or power, but for the very love of you. Hosanna, because as Jesus marches towards that cross, he was thinking of you, and for the very love of you, he shows you the reaches of God's love. Where the world hurts most, where division polarizes families and friends, where lives become currency to exchange for material goods, where children are shot in schools over and over again. Jesus is there. Jesus has gone there. Jesus knows and offers another way. We hear this story year after year so we don't forget, so that we don't fail to recognize the face of Jesus in our lives, the face of the hurt and the suffering in the oppressed places of our world. We know that the tomb is empty. We know that Jesus does not stay dead, but we listen, we bear witness, and we don't do it alone. Jesus has already gone there, Jesus is already there. In the fire at a detention facility where officers turned away. In the St. Lawrence River, a mom holding her baby. In the hallways of the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee. And on the cross of Good Friday. Amen.
with the whole church on earth, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Save your church, O God. Enable us to boldly confess in every time and place that Jesus Christ is Lord. With the humility of a servant, equip congregations, synods, and other ministry settings to proclaim your extravagant love for all. Merciful God, save your creation, O God. Every living being you have made has purpose. Give us renewed appreciation of farm animals who labor in the fields, service animals who accompany their human companions, and beloved pets who live alongside us. We pray for all natural areas affected by extreme weather events in Little Rock, Arkansas, Sullivan County, Indiana, and Belvedere, Illinois. Merciful God, save the peoples of the earth, O God. Restore dignity to those who are scorned and persecuted for their religious beliefs or political activism, and deliver them from the hand of their enemies. Bring peace to places where conflict runs deep, including our own country. Merciful God, save those who cry out to you in any need, O God. Watch over all who are incarcerated or awaiting trial, and stand with those who are unjustly accused. Be present with those feeling isolated, lonely, or fearful or ill, especially all blastomycosis patients, Jennifer Howard, Nancy Pearson, Kent Anderson, Lois Pinar, Bert Zanker, Jim Lankor, Bob Pulaski, and those we name before you now, either aloud or in this moment of silence. Merciful God, save us in your love, O God. Guide the work of church musicians, pastors, choirs, readers, deacons, technicians, acolytes, and all who assist in worship. Sustain them in their leadership as they accompany congregations through this Holy Week. Merciful God, save us at the last, O God. We give you thanks for your saints of old who embodied your servant love. As you came to their aid, so deliver us in times of trial that every knee would bend in praise to you. Merciful God, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please share signs of that peace with one another.
of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, whose suffering and death gave salvation to all. You gather your people around the tree of the cross, transforming death into life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these, your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all of your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Gathered together by the Holy Spirit, we pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Here at Bethany Lutheran, we believe that Jesus has prepared a special place for each of you at this table. 
No matter where you are at on your faith journey, you are welcome here. In our communion trays, we have red wine on the outer rim, and on the inside, we have white, non-alcoholic apple juice. During this season, our confirmation class has lovingly prepared communion bread for each of you. If you require or you would like a gluten-free option, please just let me know. We can make that available to you. We commune here. The ushers will usher you forward down the center aisle. I can never think of a better word to kneel or stand along the communion rail. If you would not like to do this or this is not accessible to you, just let them know we will bring communion to you. Come and receive Jesus, our strength in the wilderness.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Embodied God at your table, we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbor and touch the world with your love. Before we go on our way, just a couple of announcements. It is Holy Week, which means we are worshiping this week. And so I invite you Thursday at 6.30, we'll be having our Maundy Thursday service. Maundy means new, fun fact. It's the night we celebrate God giving us a new commandment to love one another. And we're also celebrating a couple students' first communion. So you obviously don't want to miss it. Friday at noon, Bethany is hosting an Escanaba Ecumenical Good Friday service here. So come here at noon for a Good Friday for a passion reading, John's passion reading, and um, for preaching by me. <laughs> Saturday, we are doing an Easter vigil. An Easter vigil, if you don't know, is a style of worship service that we don't ever encounter in the year except on the night of the Easter vigil. We will gather at 4 p.m. to light our brand new Paschal candle in its brand new stand, lovingly made for us by Steve Lindahl. We are going to hear dramatic and fun retellings of stories from Genesis, from the story of creation to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. There are percussion instruments. We need you to bring your stuffed animals because they're going to help us tell the story. And then we're going to celebrate Holy Communion with champagne. So I invite you to come to the Easter Vigil. It'll probably be a worship style you have never experienced before, and that's fun. And then on Sunday morning, we are going to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at 10.45 a.m. I hope to see you at one or all. It's a great week to worship together. Right after this service, First Communion students can gather in our chapel right off the Circle Drive entrance. If you don't know how to get there, just meet me up here, and we'll head that way together for a really fun First Communion class so we can get ready for Maundy Thursday. All right, we have been nourished by a lot of gospel reading today, and it has been a great thing. We have been fed by the bread and the wine, and now God sends us out into the world to share a bit of that love with those we encounter. So I invite you to rise to receive this blessing. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection, and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey.
serve in love. <laughs>